questions about the midterm or midterm material? Because um, most of you may have read the questions by this point. Um, is there any questions about anything there that's not clear? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, just the method generally. Um, I mean, it's probably going to give you an example, but like, I'm not going to ask you, you know, was it published by Fitzjohn in 2010 or 2011 or anything like that? Or what program would you use? What if you already did that? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, things that weren't clear in the midterm? No? OK. Good. All right. So you're talking about sort of follow on last class and start talking about inclusive fitness. Okay. So here's the build up, the scary build up, right? Was Darwin wrong? Was it failed to his entire theory? What's he talking about? Okay. No, he wasn't wrong. He was wrong about some things. Don't marry your cousin. But <coughs> what he's talking about here, he was actually okay with. Right. <coughs> so I'll give you a chance to read this. So here's his, here's his problem. I know there's just three sentences. Darwin's really good at having long sentences. All right, so what's his problem? I'll rephrase what the, what the issue is here. How can this really be selected for? Good. Um, <coughs> excellent. So, in, 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 and if it is selected for, it can be passed on, certainly. Right? Because Darwin has had no offspring. Okay, so here's the big basic problem. And also, not just sterility, um, also the other traits. So, he's actually thinking about social insects. So, in ants, in vertebrates, usually. Here's the queen. Okay, so, it has remains. You fly off the sky and you know, the and, and so workers have very good effects on either be productive. But how, how do you select on that? Because we have, let's say, have a variation in the workers. Right? have some workers that are bigger and some workers that are smaller. Um, how do I how do the ants evolve to having bigger workers if those are adaptive if the workers themselves have no offspring? Okay, so here's the problem. So what I want you to do is break up into groups, start thinking about what the solutions might be. And then we'll talk about what Darwin thought the solution was. Okay. So again, how, how can, you know, we have traits like, like sterility be selected for and passed on, even though they have no offspring.
This is nice. Have folks solved it, or you, have you given up? Give up? <laughs> Look, Jesse, how many of you have actually read The Origin of Species? I have it, it's sitting on my for those of you who are going into like evolutionary biology or ecology, it's actually worth reading. Um, it's pretty interesting. So, it's you know it seems like once you get once you get used to the long sentences, <laughs> it actually has lots of lots of really cool insights about evolution. Like oh yeah, he was thinking about that way back then. Okay. <laughs> Dude, miss the pigeons. There is so much more about pigeons. Um. Okay. <coughs> Maybe also, Darwin's book was an abstract of his full book he was working on. So this, is the, he, this is the condensed, you know, Reader's Digest version. <laughs> all right. Um, it's free online, so you don't need to pay any money. Um, all right. So, what do people think? What's the solution to this? Oh, actually, those of you who found it hard, what were you getting stuck on? Don't become what at? Don't Okay, good. He yeah, so an answer, you know. If you have imagine, you know, the er ant is sort of the sociality thing. And you say, okay, I'm going to have the babies, and you go off and <coughs> go fight spiders and get food. Okay, big plan. Right. So you're right. I mean, why would that trait evolve, and why would it be persist? Good. Okay. A lot of people had trouble with this. What do you, what, what's hard about this? Okay. Does you had solutions? Is it Darwin's dilemma? It wasn't hard to have any solutions, but um, solutions, anyone? Uh in ants now they're sterile sterile um, that 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 cast when the, when they're the closest as adults, they're they're sterile in, in general. Um, in other social insects, sometimes there's cheating. It's like worker bees can lay eggs, um, <coughs> but then there's things like policing where they're around like other worker people go around and kill the eggs of other workers. Yeah, so helping in some sort of deleterious mutations, like Muller's ratchet, like at some point you go downhill, but you go downhill towards helping, you can't get away from helping. That's a good hypothesis. Okay.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So relatedness, good. So maybe some sort of selection for you're better off producing siblings than you are producing offspring. Okay, good. We'll get to that. What else? If the worker is contributing to the fitness of the queen, then the selection of the queens that produce more efficient workers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So selections on the queens themselves, those queens that happen to produce the best spread of workers and most efficient workers have more off have more offspring. Right? So same way that, you know, your hand isn't gonna have offspring if it works well as a hand, right? But you might have more offspring if you have well work hands that work well. Um, the workers are the hands of the queen. Different individuals, but they still they help her overall fitness. Some sort of sort of efficiency argument where you keep your reproductive tissue in one place and your other somatic tissue. Yeah, interesting. That's a good kind of. So here's Darwin's reasoning. I'll give you a half hour to read it. I only have to look up one word too, so I can put the definition for you when you get to it. <laughs> So what does this mean? Mm-hmm. Yep. That and what else did you say? About inheritance. Mm -hmm. And also, the particular traits, uh, close relatives will pass on those traits. So, if you, if you have a tasty veggie, you know, other other veggies from that plant probably are very similar. And so they'll inherit that tastiness. <coughs> Good. Um, so <coughs> one thing to note here is so we're talking about selection on the community, right? Um, do we talk about cheaters? No. I think so this all hasn't addressed yet. Another thing to note when thinking about inheritance is you're not talking about genes. Why not? Right, it wasn't known. So Mendel published, but only read the paper. So, when it's still the rediscovery of Mendel, I think 1900, it was, oh, it's gene things. 
set the stage for the modern synthesis later. Okay, we've combined genetics and evolution. Okay, but this time Darwin didn't know about genes. But even without knowing about genes, you can think about inheritance. Right? <coughs> and actually, a lot of the origin of species is dedicated to showing, you know, that um, relatives have similar traits. So you can select for, you know, pigeons that have really cool feather collars and things like that. Okay. Good. So here's how Darwin deals with this. Right? Now we're going to go a little deeper into some of the more modern thinking and even have an equation. You'll, you'll handle it okay. It'll be fine. Right. So, glossary of some of the terms we're going to be talking about. <coughs> Actor. So the clear we care, we care about is performing a behavior. Okay. <coughs> Altruism. Okay. So it's a trait that seems to have a cost to the actor and benefit a recipient. Okay. Now there's some fuzziness here. Um, so, for example, if you if your brother is dying and you throw him a rope, right? Well, it has some cost to you, right? It's, it's a lot of work to throw a rope, right? But it has a huge benefit to your brother. Okay. Overall, it might make mean that you know your genes are spread in more individuals because your brother can have kids. Right. So, it might overall have a benefit to you, even though the act itself has a cost. Okay, so one sense of altruism is something that you know, has some cost, but might actually have an overall benefit. And a stricter form of altruism says that the overall cost is higher than the benefit to the individual. Okay, we're going to use a sort of softer definition. That's sort of a conflict in the literature. Okay, cheaters. Okay, individuals who don't contribute their fair share. Right. So if we're all out hunting a mastodon, right, and I sit back and say, "Go, guys." And you guys get squashed and injured and stuff, and then oh, you all eat the meat together. I'm a cheater. Okay. <coughs> okay. Cooperation. Something that benefits the you know, recipient. Okay. Direct fitness. You usually think about when we talk about fitness. Right? How many offspring you have? When will they survive? Okay. Green beer. Come back to this. Okay. But. <laughs> Basically, if you're trying to say, if, 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 if a gene is evolving and gene has promotes um, helping, right? well, ideally that gene is passed on best if you help other helpers who also have that gene. Right? And so Dawkins had this idea of a green beard, so some trait, you can say, okay, if you have this trait, green beard, that's the good my face, but don't do it. Um, you can recognize other ones that have this trait as well, so you can perfectly help them. Okay? The problem with that, is it only works if that physical trait and the helping trait are perfectly correlated. Right? If you have a combination of separate genes, then you have cheaters who look green but don't help. Okay. Um, inclusive fitness <coughs> is direct fitness, how many else you have, plus indirect fitness. Right? So the fitness you get from helping relatives. Selection, selection based on how you can, which is something we know, recipient, and relatedness, how similar, how genetically similar two things are. Okay, so what's your relatedness to your sister? Assuming you share the same father and mother. How would you figure this out? Okay, so let's say here's you, and you have AA. Right. What's the chance that your sibling has this gene? What? Yeah, 50 50. Right? Um, and so you're related to what you have to do with your, with your sibling. Okay? And we'll talk about other relatedness in a minute. Okay. So, the one I'm going to use, and here's the equation, is to do some, use something called Hamilton's rule. Okay, who's heard of this before? Okay, good. So, what does it mean? So, the relatedness probably should be a gene. Now note, this is probably sharing a gene. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a relative in other ways. Okay. Um, 
So again, we had the green beard thing. And I can say, okay, I can recognize everyone with the green beard also shares this gene. It's probably sharing that gene with one. Even though they might not have a common ancestor until way back in history. Okay. Um, you benefit, recipient, not to you. Okay. Disease class to you. And of course, the cost to you could be negative. Could be, you know, if it's, so it's an advantageous trade, it has a negative cost. That's a positive net. Now, we don't have to explain traits that have a negative cost, right? So if it's beneficial to you, okay, it makes sense it evolves. The question of the trait that seems detrimental to you, but it might be beneficial to your sibling, how does that evolve? Okay. Let me write here at this equation is RB minus C greater than zero. I subtract the C from both sides. And so if you see this net benefit minus cost is, is positive, <coughs> traits move off. That's it. That's the big scary math. Okay. <coughs> why, is this, why is this important? Right, so help explain behavior. So you have some behavior that has some cost to you. You know, if you just look at the cost, you say, okay, how, does, how can this evolve, right? So, you know, going to throw a rope to your brother, just, you know, it's a lot of work to find the rope, right? Why bother doing it? Why share food with your other members of your group, okay? And so this tells you to look for the benefits to others, okay? Here's a little diagram of that. So indirect fitness, right? By helping this one produce babies and get some benefit from that. Get some related to zero. How can you just get related to zero? How much how much benefit would it get would the yellow one get if it's R is zero? All right, so that's the basic model. Yeah. It's not going to be adaptive, but, but, it, but it could be a deleterious trait or something that evolves. Yeah. And, yeah. And so, remember, like, so weak altruism. R B minus C greater than zero and C greater than zero. Okay? Whereas strong altruism is R B minus C is less than zero. Right? <coughs> so we now have many examples of this. This is controversial. Yeah. If the if if this net net nets to zero? Yeah, if you just drift it, yeah, then you have both alleles have equal fitness, and so you just have drift affecting them. Yeah. Even though they could produce very different phenotypes, you know, your helper or not helper, if there's no net fitness difference, it's here. Yeah. Good. Other questions about this? Okay. So, Haldane, famous mathematical biologist. Why is this? 
He's like his cousins. Relatedness. Right? He's not officially related. So he's related to one half to his brothers and one eighth to his cousins. Okay. Now, note, he said this in sort of a, you know, a pub before this was published. Right? He sort of truly knew this role. He's never bothered publishing it. You can understand because, I mean, it's, it's so simple. Three variables, right? <coughs> that could help explain a lot. Okay? All right, so this whole idea of inclusive fitness, where has it been important? Okay. And it's been important in figuring out sex allocation, okay. releasing, to think about workers in the beds, health resolution, operation, altruism, spite. Okay. So spite is where you um, do costly behavior to hurt something else, use this benefit. Okay. Like we were talking about the other day with punishment, you know, like the guy in the stocks, you know. Why, the guy who wasn't in the stocks, why is he hurting this nice man in the stocks? Well, <coughs> someone could have more benefit to him, right? So you imagine if R is less, is less than zero, right, you get overall benefit from hurting someone else um, rather, than help, rather than helping your developer, okay? Discrimination, preferentially ha help, helping your kid, okay? Perhaps it really very interesting. Okay, so think about a disease invading invading you, right? So you get the flu, right? What could it do? Well, it can make you sick, right? And it spreads by making you sick. If it makes you really sick, you die, and it doesn't spread anymore, right? If it makes you not sick at all, then it doesn't spread either. Like, you, know, you don't sneeze, you don't cough. Um, it could probably be sexually transmitted, but this is a this moment you can't be, okay? It's, in other like that, you have to have some sort of physical manifestation of the disease. Okay? <coughs> what affects how virulent it would be? So, what is the evolutionary pressures on it? Mm -hmm. Right. This is trying to maximize its overall, you know, you know R, its overall spread rate, right? All right, so what if you have two different viruses on you at the same time, two different strains? How are the other selection? Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, imagine you had one that you know had a very low level of infection, so you could live forever with it, right, and sort of spread it slowly, sneeze occasionally, and then it causes you to be horribly sick, spread a lot, and then die. Right? So, they might have equal numbers of, you know, offspring overall, right, but the one that's more virulent would, you know, tend to spread better than the other one, because the other one's in a body that then dies. Because it's called competition. Okay? Um, <coughs> and so, um, Basically, if you have multiple infections at once, the disease tends to be more, vi more virulent. If you have a single individual infecting you, right, then they're all closely related to each other, and they have better, better fitness so they could spread out the infection longer. Okay? And so we actually see, in cases of diseases where you get infected by multiple organisms, they can become, tend to be more, more virulent. The ones that get infected by one organism are less virulent because they're more closely related to each other. Okay. Um, Sibling conflict, function of elements, cannibalism, personal alarm calls. Okay. So you use all over the place. Okay. Yeah. What's an example of spite? Of, of spite? Um, I can't think of one. There, I, mean, I know there are some. Um, and does anyone else think of one? Think of spite in nature? I guess, I guess actually, yeah, policing would be a form of spite, you're right. And policing is just about um, uh, looking for eggs and destroying them, that sort of narrow focus, where spite's more general class. Yeah. 
it because you're more closely related to your mother's offspring than you are to your sister's offspring. And so by um, getting rid of your sister's offspring, um, you can, especially when your mother's daughters, you can then um, increase your own overall fitness. Yeah. That wouldn't be considered spite. Yeah, I mean, and all these sort of like, I don't know, um, sort of like game theory of last last time, right? It's sort of this evolved behavior, and it's not really, it does not not it usually doesn't involve a memory process. I mean, there are there are so a lot of mechanisms we see also involve memory too. The way we're talking about here is just sort of overall fitness. Um, but, but yeah, but that's, that becomes important when we start talking about why we have these behaviors in general. Yeah. Uh, that probably could be considered spite. Yeah, because I mean, it has some cost of shoving them out. Because the overall benefit to the other offspring. Yeah. Cool. Um, <coughs> genomic imprinting is also very important. Anyone know what this is? So, a new area of study. Um, basically, you inherit genes from your father and mother, but they can be sort of turned on and turned off based on methylation or other processes. So you can stick the methyl groups onto the DNA. And so <coughs> genes from the father tend to um, that promote larger size can be turned on, right? Because in species that aren't strictly monogamous, right, that, 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 that particular female might not meet with that father again, right? And so it's better for him to have his offspring get all the resources he can from that one, from that one female. Whereas with a female, she'll have other offspring that are equally related to herself, so she wants to spread out her reproductive effort and not use it all up in one offspring. Right? So the paternal gene, paternal, paternally inherited genes kind of try to get as many resources as they can for the offspring, whereas maternally inherited genes sort of counteract that. Okay. Even though then they get reasserted in the offspring. Okay, that's a very interesting process. Okay. Um, and here's information about where they're being used for, where, where this is theory made predictions. So, you, you, you should see this sort of sex ratio, and we can go and test, do we see this sort of sex ratio? Okay. And these two tables come from a nature paper. Okay. So, these are all, so, when you read literature, you might see, you know, a single author paper, a paper with three authors, a paper with, I don't know how to talk about this, Okay. Um, this was something showing how science works. So there was two famous scientists and a third scientist who published a paper about how inclusive fitness isn't a useful theory anymore. It doesn't explain anything. It has made no predictions. And everyone in the field said, nuh uh, basically, and started writing counter you know, counterpoints to this paper. And this was just one of them that showed, you know, all these cases where it has been useful. Okay. And just these sort of science is correcting. So you have someone who, you know, one of the people who wrote the paper saying that whose fitness isn't important is Ed, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, who's super famous, right? Big ant guy, has, you know, autobiographies, always on the news, right? So, you know, high, high mucky muck of science. And yet, he had a bad idea, what people think it was a bad idea, and then everyone rushes to correct it. And it just shows how science works. Okay? Okay, here's a nice study that actually measures empirically sort of inclusive fitness. Okay, so here we have these bees, okay, and they can form nests with queens and workers or solitary nests. Okay. And 
These are haplodiploid. What does that mean? Right. And so they're haplodiploid. What does that mean? They have three sets. Yep. So in hymenopter general, males are haploid and females are different. Okay. So for female through offspring, she's half and half. So she has a degree of shift and she has two alleles. And if each allele here, so she just fits when you pass them this way or this way. But for siblings, <coughs> right? So she has a female that's much more related to her mother's offspring for a female, and she has two months offspring for a male. Okay. And so <coughs> she's be and also better related to her mother's offspring than to her own female offspring. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> she's better off um, raising her sisters than she's raising her daughters. Okay. Which sort of leads to um, leads to evolution of eusociality. But the only way you can get eusociality. Okay, so they can more rats are eusocial to the zoo and they're not happy to play. Okay. This is one of the other Okay. And actually looked at overall fitness. So inclusive fitness plus direct fitness. Um, indirect fitness plus direct fitness for queens, and more queers, and solitary females. Okay. And it's much higher for queens and more queers and solitary. Okay, part of it is, you know, these ratios, but part of it is that the work is providing the pelt that can produce more offspring. Okay, let's make sure that's it. No, the, work, the, workers, the workers are all female. Yeah. So, yeah. Queens are female, workers are female, solitaires are female. And they're diploid. The only haploid ones here are the males. Let's use empirically in things like bacteria. Okay, so here's the experiment result of an experimental study where these bacteria are producing cytophores. So these enzymes they express to help grab iron or other things from the environment. Okay, and so it's this communal benefit, right? Let's go and excrete this thing that will help us all, right? And how often do you do, you do that? So if you're in a situation where you have bulk competition and high relatedness, you do a lot. With high competition, and it's hard to do it much, and then with low related you can do it much longer. Okay. We often see this sort of inclusive fitness thing when we're talking about uh, mammals too, right? So lions, right? We have Few females breeding and everything's kind of helping. Okay. Um, coyotes, you know, helping between individuals. Okay. Um, <coughs> in some birds, we have examples of birds where the offspring from one year hang out in the nest the next year and help feed the babies. Okay. And so we figure out why that might be. And so, then you can probably see this. So, one idea here is. Um, So here's an fitness one explanation for that. Right? So by helping mom raise your, your siblings, your genes can pass on to your siblings. Right? So that's one way. But of course, there are other mechanisms too. Right? So <coughs> um, one is you gain experience. So okay, by, by feeding your siblings, you go to the babysit, and it's your turn to have offspring. 
care about and they sit on them. That's why they have more proper breeding than they're not to sit on babies. Um, <coughs> things like that. Um, it could be uh, helping the future. Right? So maybe you inherit the past from your parents, or maybe if you cooperate with someone else, you can then take over the one's territory. Okay. Um, remember we saw before class one day we saw a movie about ants in the desert and you had a group of unrelated ants to form a nest, uh, unrelated queens to form a nest together and they together have a better chance of that colony surviving and working together and then later on of course the incentives switch and they start killing each other and at first they cooperate and it helps them okay so there are other ways of helping the other ways of causing cooperation besides the physical fitness we usually help them that's one important factor Okay, <coughs> so if what matters is, you know, R, B is greater than C, right? Well, you'd want to preferentially help those that are relatives of you, right? How can you do that? And so paternity testing is not really widely spread in nature, right? So one of the things you could use to assess relatedness to know who to help. Mm-hmm, very well, so you could have things that smell similar to you. Okay, good. How else? Mm -hmm. Yep, family groups. So if we're raised by the same mother and same nest, we're probably related to each other. Yep. What else? Mm -hmm. you know, possibly fear that you could recognize similarity. Um, I'm not sure there are any ones that do that, but it's certainly possible to look at. Yeah. Yep, yeah, mate guarding. Um, yeah, and there's been a bit of work on that recently. It's published in one published in PNAS, one in Nature, about monogamy in mammals and how that evolves. Yep. Yeah. Right, but they identify like a mated pair or a mated pair and offspring. Do offspring look like, like oh, you're my cousin? Or not? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so parents helping offspring, you know, it's easy to know who your offspring are if you're a female. It's harder if male. Um, but you know, but, but this, inclusive, this inclusiveness is, is even wider spread. Um, another thing that can help is sort of spatial clumping, right? So if we have various inbred populations, right? So you come across another group, it probably looks related to the things that you hang out with than ones in the other group because you've been inbreeding for a while. The only way you can get this cooperative behavior is by, we think, is by this um, relatedness coming just from spatial structure. Okay. <coughs> um, and this is all very interesting just in terms of understanding you know, animal behavior. Um, it also, people look at, you know, the animals we care about, the animals, animals we care about most are humans, and people do lots of these studies to figure out why humans cooperate as well. Is this limited to animals? <clears throat> Where's that one example not, right? The bacteria that produces cider force. How about plants? Can you imagine this happening in plants? Yeah. yeah. So explain. So it could be. So it depends. So it could just be that that has a net benefit itself to that plant, right? If you kill the other plants nearby, you know, the matter if you're helping your siblings or not, it's still enough benefit. Um, but if you're in a mixed stand or something, if you're if you're in a large stand, you know, some sort of could definitely, you know, if this guy stopped producing those chemicals, then others are still producing chemicals that could sort of cheat. Maybe the maintenance of it in large stands comes from this sort of process. Yeah. What else?
other examples on other examples on animals you can think of where inclusive fitness might matter. And do we know if they prefer to do that to relatives, or will they do it to any who think of the mycelium? Yeah. And there could also be a spatial structure, right? So if your offspring tend to be near you, if you help a plant at random, helping that tend to have to be, like, be helping a relative. It could happen to be near you. Good. Examples, other examples in fungi people can think of, or other groups? <clears throat> okay. So the main points I want to pick up from today are Hamilton's rule. Okay. Think of what relatedness means, okay, and how, the, how these sort of seemingly altruistic traits can evolve, and also something about the nature of science and how people compete in science and point out flaws in Latoya's research. Any questions? Okay. On Monday when you come in, I want you to be in different seats. Okay, so you've been talking to the same people all semester. Um, move around. Ideally, move around vertically, too. So those of you in the front move to the back and vice versa. If you have some reason to stay in the back, some reason to stay in the front, do so. If you can't see well or if you want to go to sleep, you know. But other than that, you know, move around vertically, too. All right, thank you.